All right. So uh, welcome back, guys. Uh, we're going to discuss. Uh, last time we finished, you know, uh, a series of chapters that uh, discuss what is called the local, right, or instance uh, level. Uh, you know, the the each of the observations, how this, uh, how the model uh, weighs uh, the predictors, and then you know, uh, uh, computes the the prediction. Uh, that that mean a continuous or a or a, or a class uh, classified a prediction classi classification. In this one, which is the beginning of part three of the uh, of the book, uh, we're talking about data set level explorations, and usually, in other in other books and other literature, uh, they call it global. So in this uh, part. Uh, we're going to discuss about the different methods to um, evaluate the model in terms of of the whole, you know, predictive power of the model, and also in terms of how well the model can, you know, pe performs uh, with the with unseen with, with unseen data, which is really the goal of uh, of a machine, you know, learning model that we train it with some data and then when new data comes uh then we can get you know so, uh, a similar a similar performance so this chapter what it does is basically introduce you know the next chapters that we're going to uh, explore um some of the learning objectives that we should you know have in mind for the whole you know for this whole section is that uh, we need to understand how the model predictions perform overall. Uh, also, we're, to, we're going to talk about variable importance, something that usually give us uh, a panoramic look, like you know, a panoramic uh, look on how the model is treating each of the each of the predictors, where the most important, which are are the less. Uh, then. We're going to also try to understand how does a selected variable influence the model's predictions, and also discover some of the some of the weakest uh, zones in terms of that there could be some observations or a group of observations where the model uh, yields uh, wrong predictions, and we need to you know understand uh, that behavior too. So uh, the contents of this you know whole section. Uh, the first chapter, which is the, the next one that we're going to discuss in detail, is the model overall performance measures, right? Then in chapter 16, we're going to talk about variable of importance measures. In chapter 17, we're going to talk about partial dependence profiles. Then in chapter 18, we're going to talk about local dependence and accumulated, accumulated local profiles. Uh, chapter 19 is going to be dedicated to the residuals uh, diagnostics, uh, something that is a uh, key for especially for uh, uh, regression models, right? Uh, linear regression, logistic regression, etc. And then in chapter twenty, we're going to then uh, summarize, you know, what we have, you know, uh, learned in, in this and uh, these chapters. So basically, that just just chapter fourteen in a nutshell. Any any questions or any comments? No, so good. You know. Good. Yeah, yeah. It, it, this is just an introductory, you know, uh, 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 chapter. Okay, for what you know is coming next. So let's keep uh, let's keep rolling. And in chapter fifteen, and this is something that you are going to find kind of familiar if we have you know uh, do a uh, machine learning uh, modeling. Uh, we're going to discuss some of the model performance measures. Uh, and usually what they do is that they give us, uh, you know, uh, an, over, an overall uh, projection, right? Or an overall uh, landscape of how the model is performing as a whole. That's what we call a global or, or in this case, data set level. So the learning objectives here is to try, you know, uh, try to review some of these performance measures, usually the most popular performance measures that we use for a regression, also for classification, and also how we should uh, uh, 
you know, do the evaluation for different models because the 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 goal of the model performance is that if you uh if you create different models, you know, with the same with the same data, for example, in regression, you can do linear regression, you can do KNN, you can do random forest regressor, you can do uh, gradient boosted regressor, even neural uh, network regressors. And if you have all these models, how do we determine which is the the model that is the best performance? So that's the goal of that of this uh, of, of this uh, exercise. Then one of the uh, one of the uh, you know one of the concepts that the authors uh, bring is the concept of, of goodness of fit GOF and the concept of goodness of prediction GOP. So if you have a statistical background, uh, you have seen this goodness of fit, right? Uh, for example, how well. Uh, a model fits the distribution, right? The distribution of the dependent uh, variable. And there's some, you know, there's some statistics, for example, chi-square is one of them. There's some statistics that you can use to test that goodness of fit. Uh, the goodness of prediction is something that is akin to the machine learning framework, all right? So if you look at the book, let me let me show you here. If you look at the book on this on this section, the first the first section, uh, the author the author really explains what is the difference between this goodness of fit in terms of you know uh, model evaluation and then the goodness of predictions. And the goodness of fit, what it tries to you know the question that it tries to answer right is how well do the model's prediction explain or fit the dependent variable values of the observation used for developing the model, right? Uh, so how well does the model um, captures, right? Captures the signals, the signals that the data is giving us when we are developing the model. And, and what, what it does is that usually the goodness of fit it could be the same the same equations uh, for evaluating the, the the model, but the goodness of fit is usually going to pertain to what is called the training uh, data set, okay, which is the section of the whole data set that we're uh, using for creating our model. All right. Then the goodness of prediction. The question is how well, right? How well does the model predict the value of the dependent variable for a new observation? So now we're bringing new data to the model, and we want to know how well that model that was constructed with a training data set, then it can also have similar results with a testing data set. And sometimes you know, we call this that, that divergence of you know the performance from the training and the testing data set, sometimes we call it you know uh, underfit or over o overfitting, right? You know when our model is uh, does too well in the training and it does very poorly in the testing, does an overfit. If it does you know bad in the training and good in the testing, we call it underfit, right? So uh, you know that that's the that's the theory that the author is bringing with the goodness of fit and the goodness of prediction. And you'll see that sometimes the measures that they that we use uh, could be the same. You know, there's no difference really between the measures sometimes. All right. So any comments there? Yeah, I would say mm -hmm. that the goodness of fit is because mm -hmm. We want to know the relationship behind the, the predictors. No, not just if it's a general. We just want to know if the mm -hmm. predictors that we are evaluating are enough to understand the response. So right, yeah, it, right. it's like, yeah, it's not like that's the, the way, for example, in industrial engineering, sometimes we make experiments and mm -hmm. we want to know if, if some products or inputs 
are, you know, damaging the quality of certain process. Right. And we don't we don't want to predict that in the future. We just not to understand it is happening now. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Uh yeah, go goodness of faith, you know, really comes, you know, at, at least you know where 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 I see it comes more from the statistical uh viewpoint, right? You know, when you have a distribution, like a quality control, right? You have a distribution and you want to see how well you know your your model you know, for understanding that, how well fits that distribution, okay? I mean, you, you don't have to have it in a predictive uh, setting. Um, and for example, you know, uh, I know that the, the chi-square distribution is usually uh, used for this type of uh, analysis, for goodness of fit uh, analysis. In this case, the goodness of prediction is the new term Okay, uh, you know, before this, I, I, I never heard of, of this, of the good of prediction. But I, 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 have, uh, I have already, you know, uh, uh, used it without knowing you know, what the term was, because when, he, when we, when we uh, develop the, the machine learning model, we, all, we always have to do a training, you know, have a training test to construct the model, you know, try to, uh, you know, uh, improve the model performance there in the training and then uh we do our our final you know test the a, a last fit test with the testing data to see how well that training uh model model uh done by the training you know fits the, that that uh testing data okay uh okay so let's keep going on so in the introduction uh we want to use this um, uh, data set, data, data variable uh, measurements for mainly for model evaluation. How reliable are the models' uh, predictions? Are they stable? Are they, you know, uh, unstable or reliable? Also for model comparison, like I said, you know, if you have uh, two or more models uh, from the same data set, and you want to decide which one you know, is the best model. Well, you know, this metrics, this metrics can help. There could be other considerations for the model in terms of, you know, how complex is the model uh, when you put in production, you know, what, what is the performance of the model, et cetera. But at least from the metrics kind of, uh, uh, but from the metric uh, point of view, you want to have, you know, the best, uh, the best model, the one that minimizes a metric or maximizes the metric, depending on, on, on the nature of the metric. And then of course, uh, the auto sample, that's what we call the testing, right? Auto sample, auto time, international time series, how well that model performs with new on unseen data. You know, that's the, that's the, you know, the, the, the trial by fire, right? Uh, here, because you can have a great model uh, based on the trained data, but then performs poorly because it, it kind of capture everything, right? Kind of capture the signal and the noise, and usually the noise is, is is a random component. So we want to make sure that our model captures much of the signal, less of the noise, and then uh, to put in nuance in data that it should perform uh, close to that, you know, performance in the training set. Okay, so let's keep on going. All right, so I uh, constructed this table because you know, uh, knowing that you know, we only have one hour, uh, you can read, you know, uh, all the, you know, the details on this section of the method. But what this table does is summarize, you know, the content of that uh, uh, section. And it starts with the scenario that if we have a continuous dependable, dependent variable, in other words, our response is continuous, okay? It's a, it's a, it's a float, uh, you know, uh, number. So the goodness of fit, the one that we use for the training uh, data set, uh, we can use, for example, the mean uh, sum, of, sum, of, sum of errors, right? And the mean, let me say that I'm, I'm saying that right, just in case, because sometimes we see it and uh, okay, is the mean is this is the mean of this of the sum of the square residues? Okay, here we go. The square the square errors the mean of the square errors. Okay, 
So what happens here is that when we have a difference between the predicted value and the actual value, that's an error, correct? And we call the error the residual. So what we're going to do is, uh, you know, get get that that number, square it because we want positive numbers always, you know, to add it up because we couldn't have positive and negative errors. So we want to square it, and then we calculate the average of those errors. And that's a metric that is used commonly and it, and is known as the MSE. Uh, the one of the problems that MSC has that also the other one that I'm that that I uh, that I have here, which is the RMSE, okay, which is the root uh, square of the MSE, is that is susceptible to uh, outlier. Okay, you know when you have an outlier, usually you have a, a big magnitude of, of error there, and that could distort uh, your metrics. So you have to be aware of that, but. The RMSC usually is the one that we use, especially for a regression problem, because this has the same units as the response variable. Remember that MSC, because it's square, you are talking about the square of those errors. When you take the root of that square, then you put it in the same units as the response, and you can do a comparison of apples to apples. All right? Uh, the R square is the one that we uh, know uh, as the coefficient of determination. And the R square, what it does is that it gives us a measurement, a measurement of how well the model explains the variability of you know the 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 the, the predictions and the uh, the uh, the actual observations of the model. So it's a measure of explain explanatory variability here. Usually our square is zero to one. But I have a question for you. Can our square be negative? Or have you seen an R square that is negative? It sure can, particularly on, on the test data set. I've seen plenty of them in my days. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but can, That's can, specifically can, where it, I see it, it. it. Not, not, not in the training set. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, you can see it in the in the test the data set. Yeah, uh, yeah, it can it can be R square. It can be negative. What happens is that usually that that uh, R square is from zero to one, right? Zero to one because of the way the, the equation is formulated. But it's one minus you know uh, a division between the sum of the squares and the total squares. And what happens is that yeah, it can it can be negative. And when you have a negative number. The R square is telling you that that model uh, is not it's not suitable. Let, let's put it that way: it's not suitable for the kind of data uh, that you have. In other words, the model doesn't capture doesn't capture the you know the trend or the variability of that model. You know, to an extent that it's just a poor, a very poor model. Okay, but you could have a, a negative R square. All right, but usually it fluctuates between zero and one. Then the MAD is the uh, median average deviation and is a metric that you should use when you have you know, a considerable number of, of outliers. In other words, you, we know that the mean usually of the distribution for a skewed distribution, for a distribution that has a lot of outliers, usually the mean uh, gets pulled, pulled by those outliers to that direction. The median, uh, because it doesn't depend on the magnitude, it depends mainly on the ranking of those numbers. Uh, the median is less susceptible to the, you know, to the to the fluctuations that the MSC or the RMSC are prone because of their lives. So the MAT also could be a metric that we could use to compare with the other metrics to assess uh, how our our model is dealing with those uh, with those our lives. Okay. So those, those are the measurements that the book discussed for the goodness of feed. For the goodness of predictions, uh, we have similar uh, measurements, but they are, you know, they're called kind of different, okay? So for the goodness of fit, uh, the author uh, introduces to what is called the MSP, right? The mean square prediction error, which pertains to the model, uh, 
uh, getting getting the predictions from the from the testing uh, data set. Also, the MSP, the RMSP, and then we have this predictive sum of squares, okay, which is kind of uh, more or less, you know, something similar to the to the to the MSE. The only thing that it is not average, right? It's not average because there's no, you know, the the, the MSE uh, formula it has the one one divided by n, the number of uh, observations or predictions. Uh, here is is not a uh, is is not used, okay? And usually we have something called the cross validated R square, which they call it here the Q square. First time, you know, that I've seen you know the Q square, uh, you know, uh, in this way. But we know that, for example, if you are if you are uh, modeling in the training set, you usually use some kind of bootstrapping or cross validation scheme, right, to try to minimize the selection, the selection bias of of this uh, of of the training data. So what happens is that let's say if you divide the training set in five folds, you know, five uh, five folds validation. So each of those folds is going to have, uh, let's say, an, 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 an RMSE, okay? So the RMSE that is cross-validated, that will be then, you know, what they're talking about, about the Q square and the R square here, okay? Um, let me see what else. Uh, okay, they also talk uh, about the concordance. Uh, they see in this, the concordance uh, index which is something that is uh, mentioned by, I believe it's by Harold, okay? And that's also another measurement that it can be used for, yeah, here, uh, this guy, Harold, okay? Uh, the concordance, evaluating discrimination as the concordance uh, index, all right? Uh, usually, when the concordance index, they don't give us the, the formula here, but the concordance is, is one, uh, that's a perfect discrimination. In other words, you know, it's a, it's a perfect model. And point twenty five for random discrimination that your model is basically uh, equal to you know a random uh, uh, prediction. Okay. Okay. So let me give here. Okay. So the second case that the author uh, mentions is the binary dependent variable, and also this is usually the classical the classic classification problem. Like you have a, 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 a the response is not a continuous, but it's measured as you know a binary a choice. Uh, did the customer churn? Did the customer not churn? Uh, did he buy? Did he not buy? Uh, things like that. So for the goodness of fit, we also have more or less the same uh, 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 measurements, uh, only that there is a, there is a slight difference in terms of how they are calculated. Okay. And for example, the MSC for that type of uh, situation is calculated according to the to the author is calculated by this formula, all right. And also, there's a new one introduced that is called log 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 loss or cross entropy, okay, which is calculated by this formula here, all right. You know the log log likelihood uh, function for on the Bernoulli uh, distribution, all right. So those are, you know, and I'm going to go into much detail about these uh, uh, measurements, but it's, uh, it's good to know that, you know, that they are, they are available to you, especially for the binary uh, classification. In the goose of prediction, then we have a whole set of uh, uh, different tools. We have a confusion matrix, right? And apart from the book, Okay, the book gives you in table 15.1 an example of the confusion matrix. Uh, I found another uh, in another uh, text, uh, this one that is kind of, um, you know, more clear in terms of what a confusion matrix is. And what it does is that it uh, does a cross tab, right? You know, a cross tabulation of the predictive, you know, uh, the predictive, the, the predictions and the actual observations. Here, because the variable only can be, you know, zero or one, a binary choice, uh, we're going to have this quadrant, which is if the uh, prediction, you know, matches, 
right? The, the, the positive matches the, the condition. The actual positive is going to be true positive. If the prediction matches the negative condition, right? The zeros uh, is going to be then uh, a true negative. And then we have the, you know, the miss, the misfires, which is the false positives, right? When the predictive is positive and the, and the actual is negative, it's false positive, and this is associated with a type one error. And if it's at the other end, which is the prediction is negative, but then the actual is positive, then we have a false negative, which is a type two error. And from this, you know, confusion matrix, you can calculate the accuracy, okay, which is the true positives plus the true negatives, uh, divided by the whole uh, uh, total observations. You can have precision, okay, and you can have recall, and there are other measurements also, okay. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm assuming that you have seen this already, right? You know, the confusion matrix to evaluate the the performance of a classification model. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so this is just, you know, a review. Uh, so we have also the F1 score, because remember, accuracy, one of the, you know, the, the weaknesses of the accuracy metric is that it only, it only takes account the, the, the true, you know, the, 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 the matches, right? The true positive and the true negative. Uh, it doesn't consider in the equation the false positive and the false negatives. The F1 score uh, does it, and also, of course, the ROC, ROC the receiver alteration characteristics, and the AUC there under the curve, which is usually the method that we should be, you know, uh, uh, looking for comparing uh, the different models, and especially when your data set, the response is in balance. In other words, you have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of zeros, for example, and less ones. Or, or vice versa. So uh, the author also, uh, uh, you know, trying to capture everything, right? You know, every, every every possible model there. Also, we have what is called categorical dependent variable, which is when the response is also a classification problem, but it has more than two, you know, uh, two results, okay? Uh, for example, if we want to uh, predict, uh, you know, let's say uh, uh, in surveys, for example, in surveys that you know that you have a strong degree, uh, you know, uh, right in the center, you know, in the middle, which is kind of, you know, lukewarm and then totally disagree. So if you want to predict that type of uh, a response, then you will have to use uh, this, according to the author, this matrix, which is the log likelihood, right? Which is kind of the log loss cross entropy. And also, you can use the accuracy. You can use also the confusion matrix, et cetera, and precision. And then for counts, which uh, usually we don't, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we don't, you know, uh, we, we're not in the radar, <laughs> usually, of these uh, uh, models. But usually a count, when it's an integer uh, that, you saw, that you use like a Poisson uh, distribution, uh, the author says that usually we should use the Pearson. Uh, statistic there, okay. When it's a count uh, uh, object, an inter, an inter. Okay. Any questions? Any? Let me give you. Uh, yeah, some... Just a just a comment, I guess on yeah on, sure. on those summary measures. I I <laughs> was almost shocked to see so many different R squared uh, related measures, right? Um, uh, mm -hmm. You know, I was vaguely aware that they existed for uh, mm -hmm. uh, for binary classification, right? But uh, there's right. like the Hue squared in, uh, measure is, is is kind of a new one for me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's I guess it's nice to have a, a metric where your your measure is between zero and one because it's really easy to interpret. But um, haven't seen a lot of these in the wild. Uh, you know, interesting. I'd be interested to to try these out in the, in the real world, but um, but yeah, I, I wonder if other folks were in the same boat and that you know you're seeing some some of these measures for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And then just a, another thought, I just wanted to point yeah. out, like 
you know, it's it's not so clear cut that, you know, like an RMSE is is a goodness of fit measure, but not a goodness of mm -hmm. prediction. I think they kind of it kind of goes into both right. buckets, right? Um, yeah. The authors, I think, tried to do, you know, tried tried to segment certain measures that were maybe more likely to just be, you know, to 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 validate the prediction um, mm -hmm. and not yes. part of the uh, the fitting process itself, but. Um, like most things in life, right? It's it's um, it's a gray area. Yeah, uh, usually in the practice, you know, for let's say for a regression problem, uh, you use this kind of metrics for both. Okay, the the RMSE or the MAD, etc. And also, in fact, you know, there's another measurement that the you know author doesn't discuss, maybe because you know that there was no need, but that's also what is called the root mean log square error which kind of addresses the problem of the outliers, you know, to put it in a log scale, then to minimize, you know, that, that impact. I have seen it, and especially in Kaggle competitions, uh, usually they don't use the RMSE, they use the, the root mean log uh, square error, okay? And um, also for time series, you know, it's not here also. For time series, you have other, uh, you know, different metrics also, you know, you have MAPE, uh, you have uh, uh, SMAPE also uh, different. So that's why in that, in the chat, I put a link to a, a great masterclass from the H2O guys, a metrics masterclass. That's just the part one, mm -hmm. there are two parts. And in that, they discuss in detail almost every metric that you can imagine for regression, classification, et cetera. And they tell you exactly, you know, what are the, you know, the pros and the cons for each of the metrics. This is a very good one uh, that you should, you know, uh, when you have the time, you know, you should uh, watch it. And also this, uh, I think this video, uh, yeah, this video, yeah, is from the StackQuest that explains very well uh, how, how to construct the ROC, uh, you know, a curve and then the explanation of the area under the curve, et cetera, okay? All right. And, and just uh, you know, uh -huh. another thought right. there with the right. binary classification problems. I like that the authors mm -hmm. mention that you know when you have a severe imbalance between your positive yep. and negative classes, like yep. the rock score, the the area under the curve is maybe not mm -hmm. the best measure because a, a lot of times you're, you're going to get a pretty high score. Um, right. Just be, just be, you know just predicting uh, a negative might get you a good good you know rock score uh, if, yeah, if you, you're severe imbalance you, you, so, when so you, go ahead mm -hmm, go ahead yeah, yeah when, when when you see the the ROC ROC uh, curve what you have to look is you know as as long as the model is pushing you know, to that left you know left uh, left upper axis you know the one one as long as the the curve is pushing there your model is a is is a better predictor than random Okay, random will be 0 0.5, you know, the diagonal, uh, uh, the diagonal uh, uh, axis, you know, line. So as long as, you know, that curve is pushing to that, uh, you know, to that, to that corner, to that quadrant, your model is, is a better predictor that, than random, all right? And also, if you have a multi-class uh, uh, problem, for example, the one that they mentioned as categorical dependent variable, you can use, those ROC curves because each of the labels is going to have its own ROC, uh, ROC curve. So each one is going to tell you how well the model is predicting each of those labels too. Okay, so it has a lot of uh, great, great uses. Uh, I, I did like the comments about the precision recall curve. Um, in my own work, mm -hmm. I, I have used basically the AUC as it relates to that, the, the PR curve. Uh, okay, and, and and that tends to give you a a better sense of, of model fit. And just to give you an example, mm -hmm. you know, right. a real life model that that I had built, um, you know, because I work in insurance, you know, one mm -hmm. thing you might be interested in predicting is what's the probability that uh, an insured person is going to be a high claimant next year, you know, right. and by high claimant I mean like over a hundred thousand dollars, over a million dollars. These tend to be very rare events. Uh, right. You know, so yes. your positive cases may represent, <laughs> you know, 0.1% of, of the total. That's the prevalence. Mm -hmm. 
right. so so there are some some challenges in uh you know creating these these binary classification models and that's the case um mm -hmm. but uh, your, your typical yep. you know rock curves area under the curve is, is probably not the best uh metric for assessing um when you're dealing with that mm -hmm. um and I don't want to get into too much of a, a tangent, but like in that case, like your data set may end up being really huge. Uh, so you might try something like downsampling. Correct. Where, um, you're, you know, you're basically yeah, forcing try, try, try to balance the positives yeah. and negatives to be about 50-50 mm -hmm. to, to fit yes. the model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which, which, you know, is kind of born out of necessity sometimes. But then yeah. you're left with the problem that your uh, probabilities that your models are spitting out are really uh, hideously biased. Mm -hmm. um, yep. you know, they're directionally yep. okay, but the, the the probabilities themselves tend to be way off base. So then you have to do another model on top of that to recalibrate <laughs> the mm -hmm. probabilities so so that they um, they they you know look um, realistic. Correct. Uh, so I I do have some experience with that, and, and the authors talked about like. Uh, they didn't use this term, but like um, you kind of bin uh, your model's predictions, you know, the probabilities mm -hmm. against actual. Um, and that kind of plot is called a reliability diagram. Uh, and that's usually something that you do <laughs> kind of in that second step after you recalibrated the probabilities. Right. Um, I, th I thought it was cool that the, the, uh, the authors bring that up because, you know, mm -hmm. Um, in typical kind of one hundred and one data science literature, you know, you're you're not really dealing with that imbalance classification problem, which I think is just probably more common than, than not. Yes, um, out there. Yeah, you you usually usually it's more common. Yeah, yeah, especially you know if you work with, for example, in your case, insurance. If you're working with fraud detection, okay, anomalies, etc. Th those are you know rare events. Yep. Yep. I think that they say that maybe the best measure in case of imbalance is the F1 score. To me, that was a new one also. It's really interesting how they, rather than just check the, the precision and recall, it's like a mean that is really sensitive to low values. So you have a 9% of precision, but like 20% of recall, it will go down. Do it to the mm -hmm. yeah. That this is the mean. precision. Th yeah. This is the formula for the F one score. As you can see, you know it takes the precision recall, but then it do it does some you know some additional math there. Okay. Yeah, you should, you should go there, and you see a value. You will need to check both. You, oh, why we have a low value here? Maybe because mm -hmm. we have yep. a low precision. It's like you are balancing a, a, they have that have the same importance that's that's something like that yeah uh, to me it's really useful to have a first you know, just a single number you know that balance that sense because i think in, in you correct me and grom i think you down you can down sample your mod for training your model but for the testing data you shouldn't do it so you should Keep your data as it is, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the way it bends. So, yeah, yeah. It, for me measuring the, the the accuracy of the model, I think this is a really important measure that we need to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I the, mean, uh, the whole concept of, of choosing a cutoff, right, for, for you know, the model saying yes or, or no, positive case or negative case. Is, is really interesting and I feel like again you know the 101 type texts don't really go into much of that but mm -hmm. um, you know there's it's, it's kind of yeah. an art form and you kind of need to think about you know do I care more about false positives or false negatives and, you mm -hmm. know a, a lot of these models allow you to kind of customize a, a loss function depending on you know your sometimes kind of qualitative feel for you know how bad is a, is a false positive and, and that, that will kind of dictate. Yeah, and, and, and remember, there's no one metric that is going to be the ideal, you know, metric in any in any case, you know, you, because each one, and that's why I refer to that video, each one has its, its advantages and disadvantages. So you have to be aware of, you know, the, the pitfalls of each of these metrics because they always have a downside 
uh, here. So usually what you do is that you verify you know, different metrics and then you have the elements to do a better, you know, a better decision. Okay. At least that's my my opinion. <laughs> All right. Okay, so uh, going to some of the samples that the you know that the book uh, has. Uh, here's an interesting one. For example, uh, in the apartment uh, prices uh, uh, data set, uh, they had this result for a linear regression model, right? Uh, this red dot is indicates the RMSE, right? And then you know the box plot indicates the you know twenty five percent uh, quantile, twenty five percent quantile, and the and the whiskers, you know the I, I, uh, the upper and lower whiskers. And the other one is the random forest, right? Okay, for that particular uh, uh, set. So I had an interesting question for you guys. Uh, looking at this, uh, which model, if, if you only have these two models and you only have, you know, you have to decide, you know, using the RMSE, uh, which one would you, you know, uh, say, okay, I, I would choose this model because of this and this and this. What, what, how, how would you how would you decide Wh which one is the best model according to this data if for example you say the 500 difference is mm -hmm. a manageable problem because sometimes you say a hey, 500 of this measure is too much and we we cannot take a decision but if mm -hmm. I, I would take the linear regression Mm -hmm. Because yeah, you know that even in the worst case, you won't be over that, <laughs> you know, over that threshold. Right. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Let yeah, me put I mean, it if you're just way. looking at root mean square, uh, they're they're right on top of each other. It's hard to say, but but you can see that. Um, right. The the, you, the the thing is that it's interesting that they are the same, right? You know, the mm -hmm. the, the dot indicates the RMSC if you take it as a point. But then, you know, the box plot gives you the fluctuation between that RMSE, all right, for bo both models. Yeah. You, okay, you, so you don't have the, the, it looks like with the random mm -hmm. forest, you don't have these extreme outliers that you are getting from your regression. But okay. um, I, I, I do recall uh, the authors noting that, hey, this is, this is random forest. And uh, uh -huh. every time you run this thing, you know, assuming you're 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 letting the seed uh, change, right? Each with each run, um, right? That you're going to get different results. So there's there's potentially a stability issue here, where uh -huh. in a, in a lot of respects, the random forest looks better, but in reality, it may not be, and it just could have been a lucky bounce based on okay. That. How, how in the, uh, interesting. The was yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. And anyone else? Wants to give us another another take on this? Okay, so you know, uh, according to only this data, let's say that we have only those two models, and we have this data. Uh, what I, you know, I'm I'm cautious about the random forest is the large, you know, uh, variability that it has. Okay, according to this box plot, right? Uh, it has a large variability from zero almost to, uh, let's say, 150, almost 1,600 uh, RM in terms of the yeah. of, uh, of the RMSZ. That's actually a so good point. Link... And as you were saying that, uh, right. I didn't right. even realize that was kind of the whisker of the box plot. I almost thought yeah. that was an axis. Um, yeah, but you're that, right. That's it's huge. Yeah, it's a whisker. Uh, so... <laughs> You know, taking that into consideration, right? And of course, you know, the pitfalls of the RMSE, remember that is, you know, prone, prone to get, uh, you know, to get distorted by these uh, big outliers. I will say that the linear regression is doing pretty good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah in this case, uh, only, yeah, only yeah. in this case. Okay. Yes. Because he has yeah. the same RMSE and he has less variability in terms of the, you know, yeah. the errors. Okay. Yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, when I saw it, I said, interesting. <laughs> But let me tell you, sometimes, even though we know that the a random forest usually, usually is a is a more you know complex model and tends to you know do better in general instead of the linear regression, which is more formulaic. 
and it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get distorted by the multicularity issue, et cetera. Uh, usually uh, I prefer to have, even though I have a slight, you know, uh, less, you know, improvement in the metric, if the model is simple, is simple also is one of the things that we should be doing. Because for example, in linear regression, you don't need uh, a complex, uh, you know, explainable uh, uh, model like Daleks to explain the linear regression. The linear regression is very easy to explain, right? Because of the coefficient, it's there. But there's some assumptions that you have to be aware, you know, to validate your model. So, I mean, in this case, probably the linear regression should be the the one, you know, the, the one that is, uh, you know, fitting better, you know, the, this this kind of data. Okay, but you know that that's uh, that's kind of an outlier, you know, in some of the cases that I've seen so far. Okay, so uh, going back to the Titanic data. Okay, so we have here in the in the same you know model that we have been uh, discussing in the instance level, uh, we have the confusion matrix, and you have all kind of metrics here. You have the accuracy, you have the precision, the recall, etc., and how to calculate it, which is kind of a you know following this you know these formulas, right? And also you have the the ROC. The ROC, the ROC curve, and as you can see, that's what I was saying. You know, this is the the point point five uh, line. So if your ROC curve it hogs this line, that means that your model is not better than random. Okay, but if the curve pushes to this quadrant here, okay, the one where the true positive rates are one and the false positive rates are zero then your model is discriminating very well. As long as it keeps pushing there, it, it discriminates very well between each of the classifications, okay? And we have also uh, the precision recall curve, I think, uh, uh, SAG, right? Aaron, SAG? That, that you were talking about this, the precision yeah, the, recall the, curve? Yeah, the PR curve, yeah. The PR the, curve, the, correct. And this is, you know, this is this is not 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 a bad you know uh, thing okay in terms of the precision the recall and how you know well the model is and, and also the lift chart also here okay I have also another link that you can then check about how to construct the you know the lift curve and how to interpret it okay so let me let me put it in the in the chat. Also, okay. Okay. Okay, and then uh, for the same, you know, for the same data, we have the logistic regression in this case because it's, uh, you know, it's a binary uh, variable. We have the logistic regression and also we have the random forest, ROC curve. As you can see, the ROC curve is pushing more to this section than the logistic regression. So probably if we calculate the area under the curve, the area under the curve would be you know, greater for the random forest than the logistic regression, uh, pointing that probably is the best model. But you have to consider other factors, like also the lift chart. And also the lift chart, you have also you know, a more lift in terms of the random forest curve than the logistic regression, you know, telling us that uh, probably the random forest is capturing a better, you know, uh, discriminating better from these classes. All right. Okay. Let me see what else. That would okay, be so that... a great opportunity, uh -huh. Ricardo, uh -huh. to use the yeah. our instant level ability to understand the the high residuals. You know. Mm -hmm. That will that will be the next in the investigation. We have we right. saw in the, in the prior boss plot some high uh, uh, residuals. Right. And right. We would like to use our instant level techniques to understand what happened in those cases. Exactly. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, that, you 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 are you are correct, sir. <laughs> okay. That's why probably the authors started with the instance level instead of the global level because usually, you know, the first thing that we do from the point of evaluating the model is done with the global level, okay? And, and maybe we use some of the, 
instance level, but sometimes we don't. Okay, so that's that's a that's a cautionary tale that the author is telling us. Hey, you no, know, check those those observations. Yeah, very good point. Okay, so pros and cons here. Um, most of these uh, continuous dependent variable matrix, RMSE, MAD, R square, provide a fairly simple way. You know, you can see the the construction of the equation. You know, it's not rocket science. Uh, it's a very simple way to compare the suitability of predictive and actual value. And then for the binary categorical variables, the use of ROC, AUC, and leaf charts provide comprehensive metric to compare models performance. Of course, you know, as uh, uh, as we commented, uh, there could be some, you know, highly imbalanced data set that we need to use other other metrics like the precision recall and also the F and square. There's another metric for the binary and categorical variables that involves mentioned that is out there, which is kappa. Okay, the author doesn't discuss it, but you know it's it, it's out there. Then, what are the cons and disadvantages? Well, some of these continuous uh, develop, uh, dependent variable metrics, like the RMSE, for example, can be sensitive to outliers. We have to, you know, if you have outliers in that data set, the RMSE could be uh, could be poor, could be poor because it, it, it's an average. Could be pulled to that, you know, uh, to that area, and also the binary uh, dependent variable metrics can va vary on the selected cutoff values. Remember that these models, what they're calculating is probabilities, right? You know, the probability of one class versus the other. So what happens when the cutoff, which is usually 0.5, right? You know, to to convert those probabilities to predictions, what happens when we, you know, uh, move that cutoff? Do we get, you know, less false positives, more false positives, less uh, false negatives, more false negatives? So sometimes that's what the ROC curve gives you all the possibilities, you know, of that threshold, you know, calculated by the false post rate and the and the and the and the false. Uh, uh, let me let me check here. Uh, uh, the false, the true positive rates and the false positive rates. Okay, so. It, the, it, this curve gives you the whole collection of uh, you know each of the thresholds that that thresholds can be, and then you know the resulting uh, measurements. Okay, and also for in terms of cost, uh, sometimes you know the false positive and the false negative, maybe they have different different costs. For example, in fraud detection, uh, it's not the same cost, right? To predict that uh, the transaction is fraudulent and it's not versus that the transaction is not fraudulent, but it really is, okay? You know, there's a different cost, so that could also alter the the, the threshold, the cutoff value. Okay, I have five minutes. So this is the code, okay? I just go, going very, you know, very, very quick here. Uh, we have seen this about the, the Titanic data set, the uh, LMR uh, logistic regression model on the random forest. Okay, this is the explainer, and this is the the model performance. When you use this model performance uh, function, uh, you get all kinds of you know of, of metrics: uh, recall, precision. In this case, binary uh, classification, F1 accuracy, AUC also the under the, the curve, and uh, if you if you look at this right, at this chart which gives you the precision recall curve and also gives you the residuals, you know, for each of the each of the models, uh, what you see here is that the residuals, which, which is this is zero in the random forest, are concentrated between that zero mark, which is which is good, okay, because that means that there is no difference between you know, the prediction and the and the actual observation, even if it's one or zero, right? Because the the residual will be zero. Uh, here in the logistic regression, you see that there's more variability, more fluctuation here. And if you do the precision recall curve, you see that, you know, this line here on one, which is perfect, you know, perfect discrimination, uh, it takes longer, you know, to just decay than the logistic regressor, which kind of, you know, goes, you know, it doesn't hit one and then goes, you know, down again. Okay. 
So that's what I have uh, for today, my friends.